joined SASDOC a little while ago and are part of their founder circles. It's been absolutely brilliant for us. We first came into it to further our community, our reach, our network, and to learn from some of the world-class speakers that SASDOC has come and speak. And I have to say, it has been absolutely superb for us. Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show, uh, Ross Andrew Paquette, CEO and Chairman uh, of Maripost. Welcome, Ross. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Alex. Yeah, great to have you uh, on, on the show. Uh, so first time on the SaaS Revolution Show. We only met, I would say, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, really, in Sweden. So usually I always ask the guests, the first question is like, who are you as a person? But actually, yeah. maybe we can share like, how did we meet? And then how did we end up on the podcast? And then we can share, like, who is, who is Ross? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we met? Yeah, of course. So obviously, it was great for uh, Nathan Latka to, to bring us together. But uh, Alex and I were, were lucky enough to, to share a dinner without ever having met each other very quickly and realized there was a lot we had in common. So very excited to, to join for, for today's discussion and certainly uh, SAS talk in the coming months. But we met down in uh, Malmo, Sweden. So I happen to be a Swedish resident and figured I'd pop down there for what was it about 12 hours or maybe not 12 hours, 24 hours very quickly on my way to London and was lucky enough to again spend some time with you. Yeah, no, no, it was, it was cool. So like, I think the shows, I think one of the, the, the benefits, I don't know if it's a hidden benefit or a very sort of open benefit of attending events is that, you, you know, a lot of serendipitous things you know, can happen, right? Yeah. And uh, they're, they're great places for that. So, yeah, like I, I got the message from Nathan, like, hey, you know, my friend Ross is over. Yeah. Like, how about you guys, you know, connect and have dinner? I did what I usually do, right? And I, I looked to it for for the, uh, the 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 number one rated steakhouse, yeah, you know, in in the area. Uh, as I'm a, a little bit too much of a fan of uh, of steak, and we found this place, and it was okay. We're not going to name names, but. Yeah. Um, they did certainly butchered one of the steaks, so we asked for it rare. It came well done. Yeah, but uh, no, good, good evening, good conversation, and it you, you know nice to kind of uh, have that connection, and then obviously from that you know invitation to uh, come on the podcast after learning the story, and and, and then to obviously speak at Sastock yeah. later in the year, which is great. So we got to thank Nathan for that. And uh, speaking of which, I'm going to see him this weekend in uh, in Italy as we've got oh, wow. the, the Sastock founder member retreat. So yeah. Certainly, life is seemingly almost like back to normal. A lot of the, uh, the, the, let's yeah, say the travel, jet set, yeah. and getting around and the travel and, you know, it's fun. I, I definitely thought during COVID I wouldn't travel as much as I, as I did pre-COVID. Mm. I kind of hope that will be the case, but I'm certainly seeing at the moment there's a bit of that rebound, the excitement of like yeah. travel, we can do it, <laughs> and where are we going next yeah. sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, looking forward to that. But uh, so, Ross, we'll get to that. The, the typical first question about who who you are. Yeah. So who who is who is Ross Andrew Paquette? You know, I thought about that question a lot actually, and I feel like you know people immediately go into their 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 time, you know their their life cycle, their, their effectively their background. I suppose you could say I, I worked here and I grew up there and all that kind of stuff. You know, and, and I was thinking about this just before I jumped on. I'm like, does you know hard charging bootstrap founder sound right as to who I am? I'm not sure. A Biza aficionado, maybe would be another one. Lover of sea turtles. I don't know. Maybe those are all good good examples of uh, of who I am. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the the background, certainly, you know, both business. I'm from a very small small town um, in northern Ontario, Canada. So zero technology coming out of there. Mining and forestry were were and still are in some cases the main industries. And family still based out of there, even though I'm now. In Sweden, so as as we, uh, you know, discussed previously, my my partner is Swedish, and I've spent the last probably four years in in, in Europe, even though Maripost headquarters is still out of out of Toronto, Canada. And so, yeah, I've really, just been I mean, I wouldn't say enjoying COVID per se, but enjoying the the time that I've been able to spend over in Europe and really kind of you know engage and enjoy the the different cultures that are really coming together here. I think in you know, in, in Canada and, and certainly the, the U.S. in particular, you know, it, it's the diversity is there, but it's really not there in terms of a two hour flight to to Paris. And as you were just mentioning, a flight this week to to Italy, which is, you know, what, three or four hours away. 
So it's been, um, you know, a really exciting journey over the past few years. And we'll certainly jump into, you know, the Mariposa journey as well, I'm sure. Yeah, no, de uh, definitely. But I'm going to pick up on a couple of things there. So mm -hmm. four years in Sweden, you said, yeah? Yeah, a mix of uh, my partner and I met in Spain, coincidentally. So it was kind of Spain. And then I ended up in the Canada of Europe, which is Sweden, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've not heard it described that, but I'm, I'm no. sure I'm sure it is. But it's pretty accurate. Uh, how, how's your Swedish? Four years? Uh, zero. How's it going? zero. Ninety five percent of people in Sweden speak English, and and so I run into the rare occasion. My my partner's uh, grandparents, as example, they don't speak any English, but uh, it's a difficult language to learn. That's for sure. I mean, it, it's not Latin based. I do speak French as an example, and certainly English. You know, so Italian, uh, uh, Spanish, and so on are quite a bit easier than than Swedish. And uh, Ibiza aficionado. So I, I remember <laughs> from the conversation. Yeah. You, you recently, or I think very recently. I don't know why yeah. I said that in a kind of surprised tone. But uh, but recently, you spent about six months uh, in Ibiza. Yeah. And was that as a, a sabbatical? Were you working? I don't know. Could anyone work yeah. in, in Ibiza? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, that was actually in 2018. So, I mean, uh, every year we definitely spend a, a good amount of time there. You know, even going through COVID, you were able to move back and forth in those those summer months, at least within the EU. And um, yeah, it, it, I mean, some of the greatest memories of my life certainly happened in that first stint. Um, I obviously met my my partner there as well. So a lot of very exciting elements. But yeah, I, was, I, I would say I took a little bit of time off during the 2018 and, and now... You know, I keep my schedule throughout uh, throughout our time there, whether it's in you know May or August or whenever we happen to uh, to actually be there. But it's an where, uh, phenomenal place. Where Where do you stay when you go to Ibiza? Uh, we We have a home there. Okay, whereabouts? Or yeah. I mean, like not the exact address, but what yeah, what, yeah. What, uh, what region? Uh, it's uh, so we're we're right n near Ibiza town, so the okay. you know near where the airport is. The island's very very small, but we're we're in in that area. I guess you could say we're not on the the uh, west coast where San Antonio is, or the north where Santa Aurelia is, as an example. Very cool. I, very I've done, yeah, yeah. I, I think as we, we probably spoke. I, I've done a lot of time in Ibiza, but always with friends. Um, and yeah. this this summer, I'm holidaying in Mallorca for the first time, mm -hmm. and I'm bringing my mum and the mother-in-law oh. as well, um, yeah. uh, which which will be fun. And then, yes, yeah, so we're going to be there for about seven eight days. And then I'm taking the mother-in-law and the family, of course, to Ibiza for three days. But so it's going to be more family-oriented yeah. than the, 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 the typical previous uh, uh, sort of holiday. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, uh, it, it, it really is that, though. I, I've been telling people this for, for a few years. I mean, my first time ever going there was in 2017. You know, and I think the expectation is what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, with this major party environment. And... A couple times I'd have friends, you know, uh, flying over for, to visit from from Canada or elsewhere, and they're on the flight and they're like, are, are you sure? I think they had the idea that it was more of like the Vegas flight, you know, where people are pretty much out of control from, from you know, lift off to landing, uh, yeah, to landing. And, you know, my friends are on the on this one flight and they're like, are you sure we're going to the right place? There's a baby sitting next to me and family <laughs> of seven on the other side and yeah. so on. And it, it really is that it's more of, you know, probably 80, 20, 80 percent families and people who you know, are just visiting for holiday, you know, and 20% in, in kind of still that, that party or, or nightclub area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I've been in that 20% mode for, uh, <laughs> yeah. for a while, but yeah. I uh, go back and forth. forth. I, I mix yeah. yeah, back and forth on demand. It's good, good, good stuff. And so talking about the business, so uh, Maripost, right? Yeah. So you're the founder of Maripost. Like what is, why did you found it? You know, what does it do? What, yeah. What's the story? What's the, uh, uh, around that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Maripost operates in, in effectively three or arguably four distinct areas as a single product. So we have uh, the commerce cloud section, which is online, so e-commerce and, and retail, so point of sale as well. Marketing automation, which is how Maripost started, you know, uh, back 10 years ago. And then uh, help desk or service cloud, as it's called, which is effectively live chat, ticketing and so on. So it's all in one solution effectively a CDP or B2C CRM. There's a ton of different terminology that can be used these days, but um, we are aggregating the core business needs of a mid-market e-commerce uh, and or retailer into the solution. And so uh, 10 years ago or, or so, or maybe even a little bit longer, founded the business. I'd, I'd come out of a sales role at another company and 
figured, you know what, I can build something out like this myself, have 10 customers, do a half a million in revenue and, and really just, you know, have this great lifestyle like business. And then about, I guess you'd say two years, you know, after founding, we went from 300,000 to 26 million in about 28 months with literally 12 or 15 people within the business at the 26 million. So naturally a lot of work had to be done to uh, backdate that scale. But now we're, we're 330 people on our way to uh, just under a hundred million in revenue this year. And yeah, with our, our sites set on a public listing in the years to come. Very cool. I mean, like literally that, that, that is very cool. Great, great numbers there. And, I will come back uh, in a bit around how you got from 300,000 to mm -hmm. 26 million in, uh, mm -hmm. in 28 months. Cause, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's a lot of good stuff there. And so like, but you're, you're bootstrapped or venture backed? Yep. yep. Fully bootstrapped. So we're a hundred percent founder and employee, uh, owned. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. How much of the, the company do you own versus employees and. Uh, shareholders. Uh, between me and my partner, we're about ninety-seven percent, give or take. Yeah, oh, very good. Uh, uh, very good. Uh, so th then, let, let's talk about the, these kind of the, the early days. So, like, I, I guess, kind of zero to three hundred thousand took yeah. three years. Was that, was uh, that right? no, it was sort of the first two years of kind of that first timing? Year. We we built out the platform, and I had built some great relationships with with various customers, so they were coming on board. And actually, funny enough, I almost shut down the business. I had originally hired on a, a, an individual I worked with in North America uh, prior, and it just wasn't working out. He would disappear for days at, uh, on end, and it just wasn't working. So effectively, I, and I was still working, sorry, I had, I had another job. And he, uh, or sorry, realized, okay, this isn't going to work in this, in this capacity. I'll just shut down the business. And funny, it was my, my parents, the least you know, tech-savvy individuals I know, and our, our product at the time, or still today, is built uh, mainly in Ruby on Rails or Ruby, which is, you know, was a bit more obscure definitely 10 years ago, and, and especially in, say, Toronto market or North American market. And they said, you know, why don't you look online? There's got to be somewhere. And so I met my, my now co-founder on Odesk. I can't remember which, sorry, Odesk, which is now Upwork. Um, yep. And he was the first person I talked to and just an exceptional engineer and individual and yeah and we've built the business uh, in that direction ever since very cool and you you said earlier about like initially you thought about okay i want to get you know the first 10 customers and have a mm -hmm. bit of a lifestyle sort of business there how did you get those first 10 customers you mm -hmm. know once you had the uh, uh the, the technology kind of available yeah like well what, what, what did you do the ones that were not friends and family i guess yeah, yeah. so uh, i mean there were people that, when i say people i knew i don't mean uh, friends and family certainly i mean just i i was working in marketing automation before then yeah as soon as i sort of left the company you know they were like well what are you you know what are you doing now you know are you going to work for another similar and you know and i shared that and and in fact we still have our very first customer on 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 Maripost and um which is great i gotta call them actually but yeah, just kind of built from from that small pool. We we had maybe you know we we're three hundred thousand. We had maybe seven or eight clients uh, that I had just I had done business with, and and you know went to a couple of trade shows. We made a couple of really smart bets. Like we would we showed up at the uh, I don't think they operate anymore, but marketing Sherpa's email summit, and we were like the platinum or diamond or whatever sponsor. And it was just little me sitting at, uh, at in our booth, and but Maripost was everywhere, so it really, really worked out well. Like, and I don't think I, I've seen or heard of many companies with one employee or effectively two employees, you know, taking an eighty thousand dollars sponsorship. You know, this is back ten years ago, and when, when that was quite a bit uh, of spend, and it really just worked out well. Like, we we brought on a lot of enterprise customers. The platform was always very strong. We kept innovating and developing, and it really became a, a, a word of mouth uh, growth strategy. Like even now, a good 40 or 50% of our, our revenue comes still from word of mouth. And, and obviously that's, you know, not so systematic uh, in terms of its approach, but it's definitely, you know, the, the uh, responsible for the, the growth of the business in the early stages. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely uh, a bold move. I've never seen it in six and a half <laughs> years of, uh, of SaaS stock um, mm -hmm. with, uh, you, you know, any company probably, not many companies under a hundred employees yeah. would uh, spend that much money. So yeah. uh, bold move. Uh, glad it paid <laughs> off. Yeah. 
but you wouldn't be here now if it, it hadn't paid off. Uh, yeah. I, I imagine potentially, potentially. Yeah. And and so you're getting to three hundred thousand. So that kind of that, that that makes sense. You got to the seven or eight sort of like clients that got there. You knew them previously. Yeah. You, you know, did a few other things. But then you got to 26 million in 28 months. Yeah. What would you say you, you come a couple of the kind of like the big things that you did to really kind of transition because that's that's huge growth, right? Yeah. Especially for a bootstrap company. So really yeah. great velocity. Yeah. So what, what did crazy. you do? Yeah. We, we yeah. well, in ter- when you say what did we do, do you mean in terms of like how did we acquire the customers or how did we manage? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like what, what oh. were the, some of the strategic things and whether it was customer yeah. acquisition or like some, I don't know some hires or moving. It was really into a lot of hard market. work. Yeah. Yeah. We at the time I had this clearly unproven or, or unrealistic uh, strategy in mind that Ross would continue to sell the, the product and be that that piece, and the business would sort of support all of the layers around him. So we had a support team and, and some client success individuals come in, and we had a couple marketing people. But I was still doing every deal from you know relative start to to finish. So we didn't follow any of the you know, typical playbooks of, okay, at 5 million, you know, have these people, VP sales, VP, you know, then at 10 million do this. We, we really grew dramatically and very quickly in that regard. And we had about, it would have been about 200 or, or over 200 customers from literally, you know, single digit in that time frame. So it was a lot of just, just hard work and yeah. And, and just a close proximity. Granted, I, I'll still say this today, even with the, you know, kind of 15, 18 hour days that, that were occurring back then, that was the, the most exciting time in the business because we were closing new customers every day. We were servicing them. Everything was, you know, was exciting from a product and growth perspective. And granted, we still have that today. I'm just further removed from, from those layers, but we didn't do anything that, that we should have, we should have done. Um, and it's funny, you know, you and I, of course, both know Michael Lid, who's on our, our advisory board from Vidyard. And him, he's always baffled, firstly, that we've gotten to where we are, you know, with, with some of this background. But two, when when him and I spent a lot of time looking at the question you had, which was, you know, what infrastructure did you put in? What systems did you put in? You know, how are you handling ticket routing and, and subject matter experts? And, and how are you driving sales pipeline? We didn't have any of that. It was embarrassing, <laughs> almost in a way to, to say it out loud, but but still were able to get there. Very cool. Uh, very cool. Obviously going, going against the grain there. I mean, actually yesterday I just shared with the, uh, with the, with the SAS.founder founder members, um, you know, presentation around company, company operating systems. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, for, for us, I think for many companies, certainly in the, in, in the early years, they don't have mm. those operating systems, things like, yeah. you, you know, EOS or, uh, you know, the business processes and, and things like to help mm. you kind of scale, uh, in place. And I, I think for us, it was about four years until I kind of really started yeah. to look at, you know, implementing all, all of that. We're sort just of stuff. doing some of that stuff now. Like it's, yeah. it, it's, and it's tough. It's a lot harder to do it now. So when I'm at, whenever I'm giving advice that I myself didn't follow, I'm certainly referencing, you know, how much harder it is to do later than, than in the early stage. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've seen some companies literally do it in, in the first year. Mm-hmm. I think Hotjar is a good example. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. they, you, you know, they implemented these sort of things you yeah. know, the first year, and within within two years got to 10 million in revenue, kind of like bootstrapped. Yeah. And I think, you, wow. you know, the, the, that that's a lot to to sh- to say for you know doing mm-hmm. something like that and and, and doing it early mm-hmm. and having the foresight to to do it, which we yeah. I didn't have and uh, uh, many people don't. So you you mentioned that so you got 97 percent of the business you're, you're bootstrapped, but you did have investors at some point. So tell us about the investors, why you took money and what's happened yeah. to them? Where, where are they now? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I mean, at the time it was pretty logical, right? So this was 2016. So six years ago or, or closer to seven now, it feels like an eternity. And uh, Maripost, obviously, as we shared, had sort of skipped a couple steps in terms of the, the growth is in by the time the, the VCP uh, world had actually heard about us. We weren't, you know, five, six million in revenue. We were this, you know, 26 million in revenue kind of thing. And so, you know, w- there was probably about 120, 130, you know, parties who we met with, you know, all the way from the, the large insights TAs of the world down to, you know, the, the more, uh, you know, 100 million, 200 million sized, sized funds. And um, they were a really great group and, and very nice, but philosophically very different, right? For the same reasons that Maripost is very different 
you know, we just aren't following the model of, you know, kind of grow at all costs. And, you know, it really just, it, it, it didn't go into the direction I think anybody had planned. And thankfully, uh, the investment was an all secondary round. So we basically just took all the money, put it into an investment account. Obviously, we had to pay tax, which was un unfortunate. But, you know, over the, the next couple of years, you know, gro growth had unfortunately slowed uh, during those years. And then we realized this wasn't, go you know, really going to work and it was going to get, you know, pretty uncomfortable for everybody pretty quickly. And so, you know, as it came down to it, I just said, you know what, I'll, I'll buy the shares back and we go on our, our separate paths and, you know, and we're all the better for it. And so, you know, their, their, their firms and, and, and funds, sorry, are still, still well on their way. And uh, they've made great investments, I, I, you know, as I've seen, and, and I, you know, I wish them the best, that, that's for sure. But at the time, it definitely wasn't for us. I mean, I think the, the, landscape between today let's say and, and back then has certainly changed dramatically i mean there's pros and cons when it comes to who's founder friendly who is and i'm not saying they were or weren't you know but it's just a different dynamic and i think it, you know it was a great learning it was a very expensive learning experience for myself but it was still uh, a great learning experience to go through just the same but yeah but but no more and, and yeah. i i met, i imagine obviously giving you a you, the, the great numbers that you have, mm -hmm. are you are you still getting, or do you get, you know, VCs every on a regular day. basis, kind of every day? Yeah. yeah. And what do you do? Do you ignore? Do you respond politely? Uh, it depends on who they who they are. I mean, kind of to what what I've mentioned. So you know, there are a few firms that I have a lot of, you know, sort of respect for in terms of what they have done with with founders, and they're re really again like the philosophical approach, and, and without naming anybody. You know, there are a handful or probably quite a bit more where they're very focused on the product that you're building. They're not signing up for the financials, let's say. I mean, obviously, that's very important, but they're signing up for the vision and the product is in, you know, a few of my friends have worked with or, or counterparts have worked with these same firms. So like every meeting we have, if we're having a you know bad month or bad quarter or whatever, and nobody ever wants that, is just keep focusing on the product, just keep focusing on the product. And I think that's, you know, that's a little bit more conducive to the success you're seeing, you know, maybe with some of these large firms, if I, if I mentioned their names, but I'm sure you can guess, um, as in they're, they're far more successful with that strategy than with the, okay, we had a bad year, we had a bad couple of years, let's find a way to kick so-and-so out of their company. And I don't think we hear enough of those stories. So I have a lot of, you know, bias in that regard, obviously. Makes sense. And so you, you mentioned that you're, you're on your way to 100 million this year can you share again maybe like a couple of things or a high level plan or, or what you're doing yeah. you know to get to 100 million yeah i mean for us it's all about i mean for a lot of companies it's all about execution but we we don't have any confusion about our strategy about who we want to be about the product that we're building about the let's call it the guardrails or bookends that we're we're building towards for us it's a very clear path and it's really just about executing on each milestone that unlocks you know, new, re maybe not new revenue streams is not the right way to put it, but new revenue streams or additional value or the ability to cross sell different areas of, of the platform that, that we have that we aren't doing today. And that's really one of the interesting components is even with our current customer base, we have over 300, uh, around $350 million worth of subscription revenue available to us. We just have to go through the motions of cross selling and, and migrating and bringing customers into the overall or these new areas of the platform, sorry, is what I'm describing. And that's all in addition to our, our new, you know, new customer growth. And I remember you saying when we had dinner, uh, and also I, I think I've seen it on, online in a, an article that uh, came out mm -hmm. sort of like recently, that the company is valued at 1.7 billion at the moment. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how did you get to the, the 1.7 billion valuation what what was the the thing yeah. that kind of you, you know gave you the the valuation obviously congrats on on that that's yeah uh, thank you yeah huge. But, uh, but yeah how, how did you get there yeah so we did a um a second it's kind of a it's an it's an odd topic to discuss publicly but we did sort of a actually i'll just tell what we're doing so yeah. in in typical maripost fashion we're trying to do something that i personally haven't seen done elsewhere but i think it's an extremely valuable uh, uh strategy which is instead of well one there was step one was i've always wanted to sort of share in the success of maripost with 
our partners, our customers, you know, friends and family and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of the network that the company has, you know, across the globe, many of the same people that you and I know mutually. And while kicking off that process, given the valuation is, of course, getting, you know, very high in, in, in many regards or high. And, you know, when I started this off, I want to make $500,000. So you, you can imagine we're quite far away from that. And as that process really unfolded, we started to have individuals from Australia, from New Zealand, from Canada, US, from throughout Europe, from Asia, frankly, from every corner of the globe, who were very interested in this because they had heard about, you know, not, not, not about the, the process itself, but about it from somebody. And, um, and as we started bringing in these individuals into the fold, it really started to build out more of a community. And when I say community, I'm referring just to the fact that it's different if you were to have, you know, one you know, or, or five, six, seven, even VCs coming into one process or even one of them to having 250 or so individuals or individuals even from firms, there's a lot of people doing that in our process to, to come together and really have this overall vested interest in the success of Mariposa. So right now we're about half the way through, through that process. And uh, there's no shortage. It's literally just processing paperwork, but effectively or arguably what it should be looked at is, uh, as is a small secondary round, sorry, small compared to the valuation. Very cool. Uh, yeah, be, as you say, not it's it's not that common, but uh, interesting to see you know things like that uh, that being done. Yeah. As you said, you, ha you haven't really kind of taken the common path in, in, in many things. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, again, congrats. You know, see a bootstrap company that's got ninety seven percent you you know uh, ownership from the founders. That's got one point seven billion you know valuation. That's doing you know things like uh, what you're doing in terms of. You know, getting the community involved in you know, getting ownership in the business. So, mm -hmm. really great to see, and you know, to be able to kind of share those stories for bootstrap founders that are listening, yeah. for those that are you know even venture backed or on the path, and uh, as well, just to kind of hear uh, you know stories like this. And what about like maybe like some of the most challenging parts of mm -hmm. the job for you, or like mm -hmm. that either have been over time. Or, or maybe currently are like in your role. What what, what are the challenges yeah. that, that you face or have faced? I mean, uh, uh, I'll start in the order of the amount of pain each one gives me. Uh, the first and foremost, I mean, it's definitely the, and I think everybody's struggling with this, but just the people side of things right now, right in this sort of pre and post COVID world, and you know, expectations and markets, uh, you know, or uh, employment markets and hiring and and expectation management and so on. I, I think that's hands down the most difficult piece, especially given the amount of people we have. We're, we're, we'll be at about 350 by the end of the month. You know, it was quite a bit different than when we were 50. And I spent actually a fair amount of time talking about that. We, we you know, as, as you know, we did two acquisitions over the, over the past two years through, through COVID. We're doing actually a third small one literally today it closes. Um, so I'll share more about that as a follow-up. But Going through those motions of, you know, 50 people to 100 people to uh, 150 and so on and so forth, you know, that becomes really difficult at scale. And, and it relates to the second comment, which is what we were discussing before, just the system side of things, the infrastructure side of things that we, you know, didn't put in place years ago and, you know, at sub stages didn't have the right people to know to put those in place, right? So, like, I, this is my only... Uh, you know, startup. This is going to be my my only one. I have no interest in doing anything else, and so I don't know what I don't know. And I've only recently really started to appreciate the, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say recently started to appreciate the value of experience, but really started to put you know a direct value to the growth of the business or the success of the business or the profitability of the business on making those right hires, as opposed to I think what a lot of founders do, which is like. I could hire somebody for, you know, I could hire, a, 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 we just hired a new CFO, so I'll use her. You know, we could hire a great CFO for, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, or we could maybe get somebody for 180 and try to make it work. It's never going to work. <laughs> so you're going to do, you know, you're going to go through that person, then you're going to have another person, then you're going to have another person. And it just depends at, at what point you you realize, okay, I'm just going to go to the to the right level. And, and you see this huge change in terms of the approach. And I've seen, you know, I, I've seen a lot of funded companies go through the exact same same process because it, it's just in general, it's very hard to, you know, to hire for those roles and and bring in the right people for the long term. Yeah, definitely. I mean, co commonality. Whenever over the years, spoken to people on the podcast or 
founders that we meet up with, like people mm-hmm. always seems to be, you know, top of the pile. And, uh, you know, one of the first uh, topics of conversation when founders kind of, you know, get together for sure, definitely a challenge. And certainly when you're scaling the mm-hmm. business to the heights that, uh, uh, that you have, and certainly another good lesson there in terms of not, not skimping in terms of, you, you, you know, as you say, if you've got somebody that a great CFO at 300 K versus one at 180. You know, the lessons always there's, learned. There's, something being, there's a cost there. That's for sure. I know it's yeah. a pretty obvious statement, but I really think founders struggle with that side of things. What about like best piece or just a final piece of advice that you could give to any of the entrepreneurs uh, sort of listening? Yeah. Be extremely cost conscious. I mean, I just had a call this morning at, uh, at 10 in the morning with, with a founder, um, out of Australia and he was asking the same question, you know, kind of like, what are the three? And of course I knew I had some details about the business, but he he said, what, what are the three, you know, things that you would suggest I look at as they're, they're struggling. And my, the first uh, comment I I, I made was think about the small costs. It's not the $10,000 a month AWS, but well, that can kill you too, but it's the, it's the, you know, $500 cost for this and the $200 cost for that. And, and all of these add up to the point where you've got, you know, and this is the problem in the, the tech space in general is we've gotten so obsessed with buying all these tools. Hence why the, the MarTech space has like 10,000 companies. And I don't even know what the B2B side of things is, is probably more. And so, you know, we've been able to build, of course, or as you know, this very profitable business along with the fast growing, along with the, the, you know, global nature, along with the, wide product set. So if we can do it, you know, everybody else can, you can certainly do it when you're, you know, raising tens or hundreds of millions in terms of capital. So I think that's what gets lost for most people. And then when it becomes a problem, can't raise, you know, maybe they can't raise as much capital or, or, or as much as they would like to, there's, you know, they're, they're burning, you know, at 40, 50, 60 plus percent, you know, per, per year that, you know, you can't just turn the, the, the wheel back or turn the time back and, and make those changes later, you're now kind of stuck with them. And so I'm very conscious and cautious when it comes to anything that we sign up for that is in a recurring or fixed manner. So even though I don't approve these things per se, I still see the details of everybody being hired in the company. I still see the details or the requests for every, you know, platform that we sign up for and so on, because I want to make sure that, you know, Hey, not, not everybody's going to be here forever. Hopefully they are, but, if you, you know, if Alex comes in and signs up for something and leaves two years later, we're, th- we're still stuck with that. You know, we're still stuck with, you know, a, a poorly implemented XYZ platform or something that one person was using in the company costing 50000 a year kind of thing. And it happens more often than not. I just don't think people talk about it because they're raising so much capital all the time. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it, I think, prob- well, I don't know, you think it's fair to say bootstrapping founders are much more cost I think you have to. Aware than, even if than you're not a, yeah I think I, I'm certain they are because they have to be number one but two and more importantly I think that it just it's it's totally lost when or not totally but it, 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 there's extreme levels of it being lost on the other side like some of our competitors you know within specific verticals of the products so in e-commerce or in marketing automation they're raising like literally upwards of a billion dollars, you know, in terms of their, their, their lifetime. And some of these lifetimes are not very, very long. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, how, what would you be doing with that money? And I guarantee most of it is wasted because you're growing at the same pace that we are and we're in the same markets together. So, you know, yeah, you might've gotten to a hundred million quicker, but it took you a billion dollars to get there. That's not really a great strategy in my opinion. Yeah, no, agree. Agree. But I know I was just thinking, but, um, with with the advice that you gave to that founder about these kind of mm-hmm. the small costs and how they all add up, it also applies at home as well. So if you could mm-hmm. if, if you can give advice to my other half yeah. about how all these small purchases from a, uh, from Amazon uh, <laughs> and where else they're, they're all adding up, yeah, uh, and, and they're they're all taking the monthly budget away, right? Yeah. So it's not the big things; it's the small no, things. It's the yeah. and it's the recurring ones, right? Because yeah. you can. You know, you can stop ordering on well certain things on Amazon anytime, but you can't, you know, stop when you've signed up for a solution or a tool or, or infrastructure is probably more important. Yeah. Um, it's all it's all those payments on Klarna and I'm like, okay, exactly. it's, 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 yeah. you know, so <laughs> so easy to buy. They make it so easy to buy, but all of a yeah. sudden you've got twenty yeah. of them and they're just coming out every year. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, so we mentioned 
obviously I'm delighted that you, you're going to be coming to Dublin uh, this October yeah. to speak at SASOT 2022, our return to in-person, our biggest yeah, conference to date. Looking forward to that. Uh, I know you don't have all the details about the, the, the event, but it, what, what is it, if uh, anything, that you're specifically uh, looking forward to? Yeah, I'm actually really glad you asked that because I'm probably the least connected person in SAS, or at least the least connected person that I know in, in SAS, which is not very many people. And, and so this will be one of the first times that I'm ever speaking at a, at a conference. And what, sorry, I guess that, that's not what I'm excited about. Uh, I am excited about that. But what I am excited about is just meeting, you know, more of the, the community that exists around me, learning, you know, what are other people doing? What have they done successfully? Obviously being able to share just the same what we've done successfully and really figure out, you know, what this community that's that's you know that I'm part of is is really responsible for. So I'm very excited for, for that. And um, you know, it'll actually be, I think, three or four times in the next five months, you know, up to and and after SAS stock, where I'm, you know, again, I'm just being far more engaging. So I'm just very excited for that. I don't know no, if Nathan good. mentioned that him and I had never met before. Like we don't we did a we did a podcast maybe five years ago or something like that, and then you know a couple of emails here and there trading, and and finally you know he was coming over here, but uh, you know I just said I, okay I gotta get I gotta get out here even if I'm at sassiest for for twenty minutes it's better than zero. Yeah, yeah. no no it was good uh, I'm I'm glad you did get out there and obviously you've got a great yeah. story that like you you know I, I mean there's there's so many SaaS companies these days mm -hmm. that. Uh, most of them that I don't know, I, I used to probably know most yeah. of them. But then when it's here, like, oh, Maripos doing, you know, almost 100 million. So, you know, never heard of these guys. But, you know, we all kind of want to tell, yeah. you, you know, the, the story because uh, obviously you're doing great things. So it will be great to kind of share that uh, and more of that, you know, at Sastock in Dublin and get yeah. you connected with all the great founders uh, uh, and, and attendees there. As well. I don't know if you heard what we're going to do, actually, and for, for your listeners or whoever's going to be visiting, we're, we're doing a me and Michael Lid from Vidyard are doing a segment around the differences between, you know, it's not going to be the differences, but the pros and cons of bootstrapping versus, versus, you know, VC led and, okay. you know, where, where, what we feel and what the differences are. So, you know, whether that's our, our respective equity holdings in the business, you know, whether it's relates to profitability, freedom, you know, and then, and then the pros on the, you know, the, the VC side, right. The, in some cases, and, and I think Michael's, really appreciative of his partners, you know, the amount of, again, guidance and, and uh, education and knowledge that they've shared with him. And I don't think that always happens. And, you know, we'll probably talk about how to pick the best VC as well, if you are doing that. Awesome. No, that, that, that sounds really uh, exciting and, and great to say to have uh, Michael coming back uh, as well, which I think is going to be, yeah. be his third time. So yeah. that's going to be good. I'm going to try and get you guys to stay around for SAS Society. Yeah, and, uh, we'll figure it out. Well, retreat. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out. Uh, good stuff, uh, Ross. We've come to the end of the show. It's been right, really interesting uh, speaking to you, ha having you share the, uh, the the lessons with the SaaS stock uh, audience on the SaaS Revolution show today. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you online if they want to reach out, ask any yeah. questions before obviously meeting you in person in Dublin? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my Twitter is Ross Andrew. My Instagram is Ross Andrew. My email is Ross at Maripost.com. Um, and obviously, Maripost.com if you want to find any, out anything about the company itself. Awesome. Well, Ross, thanks so much for being a great guest today on the SaaS Revolution Show. Uh, love speaking to you and uh, look forward to, to seeing you this October in Dublin. Same to you. Thanks so much for having me.